All right, so today's session, I'm going to talk about five lesson plan ideas for GarageBand on iPad. And welcome to anyone who's just logging in a little bit late. Thank you for coming. It's great to see you. I know some of you are up really early, very impressive. Uh, for those in the UK and Australia, it's a fairly decent time of day, so it's not so bad for us here today. But today, I really wanted to talk about just a handful of ideas for using GarageBand on iPad. It's something that I get asked a lot. And this is the reason I'm actually creating a full-blown course about GarageBand on iPad, where I'm going to cover specific lesson plan ideas for using the app. So these are all projects. And tonight, I'm going to show you, talk through five of the ones that are included in this new course that's coming out. And in total, there will be, I haven't decided yet, to be honest, <laughs> I've got I've got ideas for at least 15 to 20 lesson plans, but my capacity to create that many in a short amount of time is not so great. So I will see how I go. I'm planning on releasing the course with at least 12 and then probably will add some more in over time as time goes on. But tonight, I just thought I'd share with you uh, an overview of five of the lesson plans that are going into this new course. And this is really a taster session. It's a brief overview of these lessons only. We just don't have the scope to go detailed step by step. If we did that, I would need an hour for each and every one of the five lesson plans. So I won't be doing that tonight. But I do want to talk through the ideas and the concepts and kind of the step by step uh, sequence of um, events to do the lesson with your students. Now, if you're interested, there are full training materials for all of these lesson plans in the new course that's coming out. And so there are things like a teacher notes video, like a walkthrough video. There's a full walkthrough that you can actually show to your students, a video format, which shows the GarageBand screen and it shows me showing the students what to do. And it's something you can just watch yourself or you can actually show to the students in class if you choose to do that. I know a lot of teachers like to do that because it frees them up to walk around the room and help the students while the students are learning how to do the thing. All right, so the first lesson plan I wanna talk through is called What's in a Name? And this is actually one that I've had for quite some time but I've updated it for the most recent version of the app. And all the lesson plans that I've uh, created for this course are based on the most updated version of the app. But having said that, uh, I'm just thinking through, they should all work on an older version of the app. So I know some of you have difficulty updating apps quickly because of the way things work at your school, especially if you're using school-owned iPads. I know that some of you can only get things updated once a year, maybe not at all. <laughs> things die off. It's hard work, I know. Uh, but I, the videos will show the latest version of the app. So the What's in a Name lesson plan is something that I actually devised for a, a an older collection of lesson plans. When GarageBand and the iPads came out, uh, first of all, I had a collection of lesson plans, which still exists inside my online community, which is called iPad Projects for the Music Classroom. And this was the very first one that I did. Lots of people have said they've enjoyed it. So I decided to update it for this uh, new course and it's really a quick name-based activity. It's a really good starter project for GarageBand because it covers uh, some just some basic tech skills which students can then go on to use for lots of other projects within the app. So the app works the same way no matter what type of project you're using. So it's great to start off with something that's simple and easy for students. It gets them confident with navigating the app and it can just be used uh, primarily for that purpose if you if you want to, just as a, a, a way to get into the app. And then you can move on to something more complex later on. So the steps with this one are to record a sample, which is actually going to be your spoken name. So in the GarageBand app, and I'll show you a picture of this in a moment, there is a sampler. You hit a big red start button, you say your name, and you press stop, and it records your name, and then you can play your name back using the keyboard that's showing on the screen. Now, because you're playing your name back using the keyboard, you can play uh, the middle C and that will play your name 
sounding normal at pitch. And if you were to play it an octave higher using the high C, your name will sound high and fast. And if you were to play it low down on the keyboard, it will sound low and slow. So you can get some great effects. You're basically creating your own instrument from scratch. And it's all from just recording a simple sample of your spoken name. So it's very, uh, it's a very, um, what's the word, non-scary way. There's a really good word for that. I can't think of it. It's a non-scary way to get started with the recording because you're not asking kids to sing straight up. They don't have to do anything like confronting. That's probably the good word. Uh, they're just saying their name into the microphone. And so it's, it's a good entry point. Now, after they've recorded their name sample, then you can actually press record in the app and record an eight bar rhythm using that name sample. And this can be anything you like. The kids can practice this before they record it, play something and it can be, you know, the first beat of every bar, they might play their name or it might be some sort of syncopated rhythm if they're a bit more experienced. Um, it can be anything they like. So you record eight bars and then after that add a drum part and if there's time or if you have fast students, they can add a bass loop as well. Now, I'm going to show you some screenshots. So I, I do want to say <laughs> I had these great plans to play you examples of all these lessons. Now, unfortunately, the technology, the software that I was going to use, which allows me to play pre-recorded videos, which is what it would be, it did not work today. It did not work consistently and it was too risky for me to try and use it tonight. So I, I opted not to and I've gone the safe route. So I'm going to show you some screenshots tonight. I do have a video and we may just try with the very first one. I will hit play on the video. I suspect you're not going to be able to hear the sound of it, which will totally defeat the purpose of playing the video. So when we get to that point, I'll ask you to comment in the chat window and say, can you actually hear anything or not? And if you can't, then I will skip over the next few videos that I have later on in this training session. But what I'll do is if it's not working um, well tonight, and even if the video does play tonight, the audio quality is going to be not very good. So what I'll do is I'll actually record these videos and upload them to YouTube uh, in a separate video. And um, we'll just make sure that you can click through to listen to the examples so that you can, you'll have to do this after the session's taken place, but you'll be able to do that and hear them properly. So I, I was very sad today that I just couldn't get it working, but you know, that's the way things are and you have to have a contingency plan. So this is my contingency tonight. So this is what the sampler looks like when you open up Gar GarageBand, you basically scroll through and find the instrument that you want to, to use. And the sampler is located in the keyboard option. So you'll find the keyboard. And if you look at the very bottom of the screen, there's an option called sampler. And when you open that up, this is what it looks like. So you hit the big red start button, you say your name, and then you press stop. And you get your sample recorded in there and it ends up looking just like this. Once you've got this and you can see the little yellow waveform there on the screen, that's my name. And then I can play back using the keys of the keyboard, which appear at the bottom of the screen. So this becomes my instrument. My name is the actual instrument sound and it's lots of fun. You don't have to use your actual name for this. Of course, you could use a body percussion sound or the sound of a dog barking or you could play a single note on a kazoo or any instrument that you've got in the classroom and that will become the sound of your keyboard that you can play back. So once you've got your sample recorded like this, you hit the little red record button up the top there and then you'll hear a met metronome counting and you'll play some kind of rhythm to last eight bars. Now once you've done that, Students can then add, if you head over into the track view of GarageBand, it looks something like this. And this is actually the version of track view once I've recorded my sample and also added a couple of tracks, but I'll just talk through what's here. And I'm explaining some of this because I'm going to guess that some of you haven't uh, played a lot with GarageBand. Maybe you can type in the chat window and let me know if it's fairly new to you and you haven't really used it before. Essentially, you will have an instrument that you play. Once you've recorded something, you head over to this view, which is called track view. And this is where you can see what you've recorded. 
So if I just recorded my name sample, that would be the only thing, the top track there, the very top green part would be my name sample. And then what I've done in this is gone, gone ahead and added in a drum machine part, a ready-made sort of generated pattern, and also a bass one. And Joy's saying she is new to GarageBand. Yes, I, I suspect you're not alone there. Other people can let us know too. And uh, it it does work a little bit differently to some other programs that you may have seen and used in the past. Now, the biggest difference I found with GarageBand, the app on iPad, is that you are constantly switching from instrument screen to track view screen. So if I just go back one slide to here, this is the instrument view where I can see the instrument that I'm playing and I'm recording. And then once you've used that instrument, you go into track view. If you can see at the very top of the screen, kind of on the left-hand side, there's a little button which looks like a brick wall. Now that's the track view button. So once I'm in this screen, I can tap on that little track view button and that will take me through to this one. And this is the place where I can see what I've recorded. Now I think that I'm pretty much sure that the app is set up this way that you're switching from instrument view to track view and back and forth because there's not a lot of room on the screen to have both showing at once. If you were using the desktop version of GarageBand or if you've ever used Soundtrap, you will actually see the tracks that you've recorded and also the instrument that you're playing on the screen both at the same time. But there really isn't much space on the iPad screen, so I think that's why they've organised the app this way. I found that a little uh, confusing at first, once I got into the groove of it, it was so, it, it was fine. It was easy. It just took a little time to get my head around the fact that I'm switching from instrument view to track view and back again. Great. Um, just checking the comments here. Yeah. So a couple of other people saying they're new to it or out of practice with it. I think that's a key point, actually. Um, admitting that you're out of practice with something because technology really is like uh, learning an instrument. If you leave it alone for a while, I'm the same. I forget. I forget what I, how to do things, where to find things. So, yes. And um, Kylie's, I'm just going to pause and answer these questions actually. Kylie's just asked, does GarageBand app update when your software, iPad software updates? Um, not strictly speaking, but I have mine set to update automatically. So I often don't realize when it's updated. It just updates in the background. I don't do that with my laptop. I find it, I don't know why, it's more worrying on the laptop when things update without me knowing. But on the iPad, I do. I just let all the apps update. So that's a setting you can turn on in your general iPad settings that your apps will update. So the software will update and then separately the apps do their updating thing. And uh, another guest from the UK used a lot and free ideas. Oh, great. I'm glad. I'm glad the ideas have been good. So that's excellent. So track view here, once you're in track view, this is where you can also add a new instrument to your project. At the bottom left-hand side, there's a little plus sign and you'll tap on that to add a new track in. So once I had recorded my name sample, I tap on the little plus button and then I went to find a drum machine that I could use and then I added a drum pattern. So conceptually for this project, for this lesson, recording the name sample, the students are creating their name for a, an instrument from scratch. They're recording a rhythm that they are improvising or composing themselves, then adding some kind of drum pattern to it. And to be honest, in GarageBand app, there are so many ways to add drum patterns, it's not funny. And they range from almost no musical input on behalf of the user through to playing completely manually the drum pattern in. And I think this is a really good thing because you can use that to your advantage if you're short on time or you have beginner students or less experienced students you can get them to use one of the more ready-made drum pattern options and that's totally fine. Down the track, you can get them to do it more manually if you want to where they're playing something in from scratch, but it's totally fine to use that if your focus was the rhythmic element and creating their name sample, for instance, in this lesson. So then the last track that you can see at the bottom there is actually a loop from the loop library, which I've added in, and uh, that's just to, to create a quick bass pattern there. All right, 
I'm going to press play. This is the video. I'm going to press play and turn my volume up and maybe you can just tell me if you can hear anything at all, <laughs> what you'll see in the video if it works and I'll let it play through. It's very short. What you'll see in the video is uh, me. I've just recorded my name sample and you'll hear me playing it back on the keyboard. And then the next thing is that I will go and just hit play on the completed project. So you'll hear the recording of my name sample playing along with the drum pattern and along with the bass loop. Katie. 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 All right, so that's the first lesson. It's a super quick one that you can do and um, it's lots of fun. I've done it a lot in workshops with teachers and sometimes with students too and it's just a great easy way to get started. Okay, so the second one I want to talk through is an option uh, of creating a world music project. So um, I don't know if you've opened up the app and explored the fact that there are some world music instruments in the app. And it's a great way to explore instruments that you are probably not so likely to have access to in your classroom. It means that you can see the instrument, you can get the kids to experience the instrument in some way. It's not the real instrument, of course, but it's a great substitute, if nothing else. So, one idea for using the world music instruments in GarageBand is to do a project about one of them. So I've chosen the Ahu and I've looked up the pronunciation of that, so hopefully I'm saying it right. The Ahu is a stringed instrument. It's a Chinese stringed instrument. And this is a great thing for students to start off before you even get to GarageBand is to start off actually researching the instrument watching some videos on YouTube so they can see what it looks like in action, hear it being played and see the type and the style of music that it's used for. It's a really beautiful instrument. It's very expressive and melodic and it's something that's used for programmatic music at times where uh, the, the player will actually imitate sounds from nature like birds and horses and so on. So you can take this instrument and open it up in GarageBand and actually get the kids to play it. And it's just a great way to kind of experience it uh, firsthand. So uh, once they've done sort of the background information and looked into it, and, and this might be something where you get them to do some writing about the history of the instrument and how it works and so on, you can then get them to compose a theme using the instrument in the GarageBand app. So here's a picture of what the actual instrument looks like. This um, this beautiful player, she, this is a video, a still from a video on YouTube. And she talks through the instrument, how it works, um, the fact that the bow is always attached to the strings, kind of hooked through the strings, which is unlike um, the string instruments that we're more familiar with in like a Western orchestra. And uh, she talks through, you know, sort of how the sound is produced and what types of sounds it can make and gives a really lovely demo on YouTube too. So the steps with the lesson are that students can open up the instrument and just experiment with it. They can play the strings, they can test out some techniques, uh, test out some of the different sounds that it makes. And then after that, they can compose a melody. Now, the instrument by default is set to a pentatonic scale, which is kind of useful. Uh, pretty much anything that they do is going to sound pretty good. <laughs> so you can leave it set to that and um, you don't have to. You can actually change the setting if you want it set to a different scale. Um, there's an option for doing that. Once they've composed a pentatonic based melody, then they can add some kind of accompaniment. And that could be something that's recorded by them from scratch or you can use a ready-made loop, which is what I've done in my example, used a ready-made loop from the loop library, which is of a Chinese, um, it's like an accompaniment style loop, which is really lovely.
So this is what it looks like in, in GarageBand. So screenshot it only at this time. I do have a little video. So when you open it up in GarageBand, you'll you'll look at the instrument um, switcher thing. What's it called? The instrument browser. And you'll scroll through and you'll find that there is an option for world instruments. And at the bottom of that section, you'll see Ahu as an option. And there's about three other options there too. So this is what it looks like when you open it up. So there's only two strings. And you can just pop your finger onto the string to make a sound. And you can see on the right hand side, it says that it's set to the major pentatonic scale. Now, because it's set to major pentatonic, it actually has very faint squares on the, the like the fingerboard there. And the shaded ones, the ones that are lighter, are the tonic note of the scale. So you can kind of anchor yourself with those. Now, the bot buttons down the bottom of the screen allow you to create sort of some effects while you're playing. So there's a little grace note option. There's a trill option. The horse option is very cool. And I think in my video, I have got an example of that so you can hear it. And then there's the um, increasing vibrato option. You can slide your finger along that wiggly line to increase or decrease the amount of vibrato while you're playing the instrument. So this is what it looks like in um, GarageBand. Once you've recorded, so this project basically, uh, I've got it so that you're recording a simple pentatonic melody just for eight bars again. And then the blue section that you can see at the bottom there is an accompaniment loop from the loop library. So this is a pre-existing one, but it's a really lovely one to play along with. You can do this in two ways. You can actually have the students record their part first just to a metronome click, or you may actually want to, them to add the loop into the project first of all so that they're playing along with it like a backing track. It really doesn't make too much difference to the end result, but it might depend on what you want them to experience. All right, so here's my video. You, you all said you could hear the other one, so I'll play you this one. You'll uh, just hear me starting, starting off, you'll hear just what the instrument sounds like. I just play a few notes and I just uh, demonstrate what those buttons do at the bottom. And then you'll hear it switch over to playing through the actual project. So that again, nice simple project just to get started and um, it's a good one if you've ever, uh, some of you may have used the app called Explain Everything which is like a whiteboard app, kind of like a PowerPoint on steroids type app. What you can actually do is get students to gather research information into that app and present everything really nicely there. So something I've done is um, put text together with images of the instrument and then actually sent across my GarageBand recording to go along with, you know, the, the research that I've done. So that can be a nice way to sort of do a digital portfolio version of presenting the lesson. <laughs> Just reading the comments, yet yeah, the horse will be a winner, I know. I'm actually wondering uh, how hard it will be to get students off the horse effect. <laughs> You may have to let them get it out of their system and then <laughs> and then move on to something else. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, as a teacher, you look at it and you go, oh, awesome. And then you go, oh, <laughs> it's going to be really distracting for some classes. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, the next one I want to talk through is uh, what I've called Dr. Zeus Grooves. And um, the hilarious thing about this <laughs> You know those things where you think you've had this awesome original idea and then you find out that like 7,000 other people have had the same idea? So this is one of those examples. I was um, I was watching a video. Some of you might be familiar with a video of a rapper doing 
uh, a performance of a children's book called Llama Llama Red Pajama. It's really good. Like, it's really cool. This rapper does a version of that. And it, it just sounds really cool. And I thought, wow, this would make a great project for kids to do at school in something like GarageBand. And they could pick a kid's book and do their own rap version and make up a backing to go with it and so on. And my thought immediately was Dr. Zeus books would be fantastic for this, really good. And then I went on YouTube and found that, I'm not kidding, there's there's probably 20 videos. If you just type Dr. Zeus rap into YouTube, you'll find at least 20 videos <laughs> of other people already doing this exact idea. So, um There you go. It wasn't original, but I did have the thought by myself and then found everyone else had had done it already. (laughs) So the idea with this lesson, and and this can be a bit more involved, this lesson, if you want it to be, or it can be fairly uh, straightforward and simple and shorter. So I'm going to give you just a couple of ways of doing this. But basically, students are going to create a Dr. Zeus ostinato, (laughs) as I've called it, and a Dr. Zeus rap. And this can be one and the same project. Or if you just want to do one thing, you can. You can just do the ostinato, which is a shorter portion of the lesson. Now, I've mentioned these examples on YouTube. Do go and look up Dr. Zeus rap on YouTube. There are some really good options uh, for watching and Most of the ones that I came across were actually clean, so that was a good thing. There's one called, um, one of the original ones was called, uh, is based on the book, There's a Wocket in My Pocket. And so if you look up that, um, it's it's very cool. It's very cool. There's just a couple of guys (laughs) doing a rap version and they're holding the Dr. Zeus book and doing it, you know, reading it through while they're rapping over the top of it. Uh, So that's great. There is actually also a great video of some teenagers doing it as a talent show uh, item on, I think, like a camp or something like that. And that is also a great option uh, version to show kids because two of them are wrapping the Dr. Zeus book. And I think they've done, it might be One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, that book. Uh, two of them are rapping and one's actually beatboxing along with them and he's a really good beatboxer so it's a great thing to play kids. So this is a project or a lesson that's great for groups to get involved with. So you can have more than one kid doing the rap version of the book and uh, you can get them either doing multiple tracks so they can do one track each or they can do some parts uh, unison together where they're actually saying stuff at the same time into the same microphone Or somebody can do the interjection kind of thing. I don't even know if that's the rap terminology for it, but if you listen to any rap music, you know, there are people sort of interjecting interjecting at times with yo's and and whatever. And I'm very white and uncool and it does not sound cool when I do it, but you know what I mean. So it's a great one for groups to do. Um, If you have older students and someone is capable of beatboxing reliably, it would be a fantastic thing for them to do and actually do the beatboxing for the accompaniment part. So uh, there are two sections to this project, as I mentioned. You can do one or you can do both. And I'll just talk through, you know, how I've envisaged it and then I'll play my example. So uh, the idea was originally I was thinking of this as just the book wrap project, but it kind of occurred to me that the simple title of number of Dr. Zeus books makes a really good source material for creating something just on its own, standalone thing. And so I thought that if you want to do an extended project, you take the title and create like a spoken ostinato thing. And it can be quite creative where you're just saying words from the title rhythmically. It might be parts of the title and so on, and you can create rhythms from it. The thing that I had in mind when I was uh, thinking about doing this with Dr. Zeus titles is, you know that um, most of you will probably be familiar with that Harry Potter rap, Uh, what's it called, Harry Potter, like it's a good ostinato example where there's the different names of the characters in Harry Potter are used as um, ostinati, uh, you know, layered ostinatos with each other. So you can do that sort of thing simply with the title of the Dr. Zeus book because most of them are very, uh, they're all rhyming kind of ones and they work really well. They're kind of rhythmic. uh, Before you even try to be rhythmic, it's rhythmic anyway. So, So this can be the first part of this project. You can create this ostinato, you can uh, put a drum backing to it, 
And that could be a standalone project on its own. So if you've got younger students or you don't want to spend too much class time on this, that could be it. You might just do that ostinato section. Now, the second section is that the kids actually perform the whole book or part of the book, if it's one of the longer ones, and record it as a rap, like the ones that you can see on YouTube, like those examples. And again, in GarageBand app, you'll add a drum pattern of some kind, and then the kids will record the rap over the top. Now, this seems really straightforward, but to be honest, there's actually a lot more to it than would appear at first, <laughs> because when I was doing my example, I found that there are multiple ways of actually saying the words in a rap style. You can do it in a Cardi B rap style. You can do it in a Beastie Boys rap style, which are quite different. If you're familiar with those, they're quite different, or an Eminem rap style. If you listen to those artists, they have quite different ways of rapping. And so the words of the book can be said in any of those or a combination of those styles. I also found that musically, there are times when you need to repeat a little section just to kind of get it to the end of a musical phrase. And there are times where I found that, you know, you might just like one of the lines in the book and you might want to say it a few times. So the kids can be quite creative with this and take a little bit of license where they're not just reading the book through with a, a sort of a what do you call it, a monotonous tone, <laughs> but varying it a little bit. If you've got groups of students doing this together, they can say some bits solo. They could take turns at doing solos. They could say some sections together as a group. That sounds really good. And, you know, if they're not doing the main part of the book, they could be doing extra backing things like interjections and stuff like that. And then to finish off the, the overall, you know, piece of music, um, you can actually put that same ostinato intro as the ending. So I'll, I'm going to show you my example in a second, but book options for this, I mean, really any of them will work, but the examples that you see on YouTube are the top three, really. There's a Wocket in My Pocket, Fox in Socks, and One Fish, Two Fish. The Cat in the Hat probably works too. I didn't try that out. Um, there are many, many others. So whatever you can get your hands on, uh, give it a go. So just briefly with this ostinato section, um, the book title and the author is, is a great place to start as source material for this ostinato. So I chose there's a wocket in my pocket and I actually started off just using the words wocket and pocket and that was it and I just said them rhythmically and this was one of my tracks in GarageBand. So it's just wocket, pocket, wocket pocket. I actually added an effect to my voice to make it sound really deep and it sounds kind of cool. I think maybe better just than my plain voice, my plain normal talking voice. Um, you may like to include the name Dr. Zeus in there as well in, as part of the ostinato source word, source material. So just using that title, it's a great place to start. Um, if you've got younger students, this would be good because it's a limitation on, you know, what they need to actually say if they're not uh, quick readers. Uh, saying the whole book in a rap style, you do need to be fairly on to reading. You know, you need to be fairly uh, fluent reader and you need to be able to sort of calculate how it's going to fit rhythmically. Um, having said that, you don't have to record the whole thing in one go. You can do short sections. But if you have got younger students, just this first bit would be a good way to start, I think. So you can say the full title in this ostinato, you could use single words, you can use repetition, you can get kids to vary their voice, the way they actually say things. So some things might be spoken, some things might be loud, some things might be whispered, you can put effects on, you can do more than one part. So I, I did, as I said, walk it, pocket, walk it, pocket as one of the parts and then I added other parts on top of that. And this can be just four to eight measures long. And you can just record it over a beat. So uh, have I got the example here? This is what it looks like when you open up the audio recorder for where you record your voice. And basically you'll test your levels and you can see the level on the left-hand side there. It's in the red because when I took the screenshot of this, <laughs> it made a loud sound and it went into the red. But what you really want is it to be showing green, green when you're recording. And uh, basically you're in this screen and you hit record and you record your voice part. 
Now, once you've recorded, you can access this other tab in the same screen, but just the fun tab as opposed to the studio tab. This is where you can access some effects. So there's the monster effect, which makes your voice go really deep. There's the chipmunk one, which obviously makes your voice go high. Um, that gold microphone at the uh, next to the chipmunk there is an auto-tune option. So you can add auto-tune if you want to. And you can see the other things there on the screen. Kids can just have a go, record something and just um, put an effect on and see what it sounds like. This can be great using effects if, um, if some students are a little bit shy about recording their voice. It just means that what you're hearing back is not their, it's not as confronting, it's not their real talking voice, it's got some kind of effect to it. So it can be useful. Okay, so uh, this is the example of the ostinato recording. I don't think I've actually got the video here. I think I've got that later on. Have I got the video here? I'll press play in a second and see. But just to explain what you can see on the screen here, drum part up the top there. Second track down is me saying walk it, pocket, walk it, pocket with a monster effect on. The third track down uh, where it's got a telephone picture is me, uh, I'm just using the words, there's a in my, there's a in my, and they're set, they're set in a rhythmic way, which kind of goes in between the wocket pocket part. And then the bottom one is me just saying Dr. Zeus or something like that. I can't quite remember. Okay, okay, I have got, I've got, I'll play the example of that in a moment. Okay, so the second section, if you want to <clears throat> do this part as well, is that the students record the whole story as the rap. They can vary the delivery of the rap by um, doing the things we said, if, especially if they're working within groups. It can be solo sections, group unison type sections. They could do call and answer type style. They can do interjections and so on. And as I mentioned before, sometimes it is musically necessary to repeat certain verses and phrases just to make it kind of rounded out musically um, and you can only really work that out when you're doing it I think. <laughs> so this is what the whole thing looks like. Now there are three sections in here so in GarageBand when you record uh, a section of music you, you actually do work within sections. So when I recorded the ostinato part, that was section A and it was eight bars long and that's the bit that you can see at the very left-hand end. And then the next section along is section B, which is where the rap part is. And then section C on the right-hand side is the outro, which is basically a repeat of the first section. I'm just going to show you, I've got some markings here which show you where those sections are really clearly. Now, the reason for just talking about this is that uh, it's good to know that when you're in GarageBand, you record within one section and then what you can do is add a new section after it. So this was sort of set up originally to cater for verse, chorus, verse, chorus and intro and outro in a, a traditional pop song format. So what you could do is record verse one and then record verse two in another section and having them in separate sections in this way means that you can duplicate an entire section with all the parts in it for when that thing comes along another time. So if you are recording a pop song in the GarageBand app and it's the verse section, you're best to record all the parts of the verse section and then in the next section record all the parts of the chorus and then what you'll do is come back and duplicate the verse and put it after the chorus and then duplicate the chorus and put it after the verse and so on. And it really does save time. So what I did when I was setting up this project is I recorded section A, then I recorded section B, which was the main rap part. And all I did after that was to duplicate section A and that became the last bit. So I didn't need to re-record the stuff that's in section C that you can see on the screen there. It was simply a duplicate version of the first part. I hope that makes sense. Um, just good to know that about the GarageBand app and the way it works. It's a little bit different to some other apps and it can you can really use it to your advantage. It's also good for talking to students about form of songs as well. Although, unfortunately, even if section A and C are identical, you can't change the name of section C to make it section A, if you know what I mean. I wanted there to be a way to do A, B, A, 
Musically, it is ABA, but it's called C in the app and you can't really change that. So if that's confusing for your students, if you think it will be, don't, don't broach that part, maybe. All right, so here's my example. So you'll hear, first of all, um, the ostinato section, and then you'll hear a little bit, I won't play the whole thing, but a little bit of the walk it in my pocket rap section. Um, this is me sounding not so cool, trying to be cool, but not really cool as a rapper. All right, that'll do. It's enough of that. <laughs> uh, a little bit cool, thank you. <laughs> Comment, I'm just reading the screen. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. Um, my son, Josh, he's 12, actually does a lot of examples of things for me and he's away at the moment, so I couldn't get him to do this one. I had to do it myself and, um, yeah, I need to find someone else that sounds a bit cooler than me. But you get the idea. At least there's an example there for you. It's lots of fun. It's really lots of fun to do. And um, yeah, I think it's a, a really good one. So again, you know, it's one of those adaptable things that you can uh, do as much or as little of as you have time for. All right. So the fourth lesson plan I'd want to uh, just talk about is one that I've called classical smash. And Really, you can use anything for this. I have gone with Puckle Bell's Canon and I know lots of people are probably groaning right now and you're probably all over it, but it's a really good one to do because it's so easy for kids to play, um, at least some of the parts. And because the parts get progressively more difficult, it can cater for your kids that can play them. The ones that can't play as well or less experienced can stick with just the bass part and it's nice and easy and it's, you know, it's all, I don't know, it's, it's a good one to use. But really, you can use any classical piece you like for this. So uh, this is one where you can take a classical theme of some kind. It can be a melody or as I've done is take the, the bass part, the basso continuo part from Paco Bell's Canon and talk to kids about arranging or remixing it in some kind of way. Now, I've grown up being an arranger and that's the term that I know, but if you say music producer instead to kids today, it's going to sound a lot cooler. So a music producer these days is in effect an arranger because that's what they do. If they're a good music producer, they are actually arranging the music in some way and remixing and so on. Now, Puckle Bell's Can is also a good one to use because there are quite a number of cover songs. I've said cover song, it's not really a cover of the piece, but there are a number of songs that use the chord progression from Puckle Bell's Canon. So you could play examples of those for students. Um, and I'm thinking things like uh, Green Day, which Green Day song is it? It's escaped me. It's very fast, but it is the chord progression from Puckle Bell's Canon. There's also the Vitamin C Graduation song that lots of people use that actually uses snippets of Puckle Bell's Canon in it. So you can talk to them about using, you know, this as, again, source material for an arrangement or some sort of uh, musical piece that they're going to create. And it's a great time to talk about techniques that you can use to make the music different in some way. So at the bottom, I've just listed a few things there. You can change tempo, you can change the key, you can change the feel. And by feel, generally speaking, the easiest way to do that is to add a drum pattern, which is vastly different to the original piece of music. And in this case, adding a drum pattern at all is going to make it sound different but also changing the instruments too. So rather than using string instruments, you know, you might use an electric guitar 
to play the theme and that might be the way that you get the kids experimenting with different sounds and styles and so on. So the steps for this lesson are that the kids will record the bass part of Paco Bell's Canon. Then really the rest is optional, any of these things or all of these things. Um, you can add a smart instrument accompaniment. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. You can add a drum part. And again, there's many ways to do this in GarageBand from sort of instantaneous and easy through to uh, creating something from scratch. And the last thing that I've suggested is that they compose an original melody to go over the top. So not one of the uh, the ones that's in, in the piece of music itself, but something they've composed themselves to go with it. So uh, if you do want, I did actually start with cello playing the bass part. So if you do want to do that, when you open up the GarageBand app, you can scroll through and find the string instruments and open up. And once you do that, you'll see up the top of the screen, there's pictures of violin, viola, cello and bass, and you can tap on the one that you want to play. Now I'm in the notes view of this. So uh, I think when you first open the strings up, you'll see chords view, which looks a little bit different. But if you want just to hit head to notes view and then choose a specific string instrument, you can do it this way and you'll end up in this screen. Okay, so, um, so the strings here, you can hit record at the top and you can play with your fingers individual notes on the, the fingerboard there to create the bass line. So you've got to, you're going to have to coach the kids a little bit perhaps or they can experiment and find out where the right notes are. Okay, so then after you've done this, and you'll hear me play this in a moment, this uh, cello part, but just to show you uh, the second part that I added in my example was a smart guitar part. Now, the smart instruments in GarageBand are kind of unique because they allow you to play chord strips. So you can, if you're not a guitarist, you can open up the smart guitar and you can see a series of chord strips that you can play. And it looks like this. It reminds me a lot of the auto harp, which my mum used to play in her primary, when she was a primary music teacher, she had an auto harp in her class where you press a button and strum all the strings and it would give you a D major chord or a G major chord and so on. So it's kind of like that concept. Now, in addition to that, the, each of the smart instruments, and you have a smart guitar, there are smart strings, there are smart uh, keyboards as well, and smart drums, different though, but uh, all of those melodic ones look very similar to this. Now, all of them have somewhere on the screen an autoplay dial, and you can see it at the right of my screen here that you're looking at. If you turn the autoplay dial to one of the numbers, so number one, two, three, or four, and then press one of the chord strips, it generates a pattern automatically for you. So this is really great. If you're not a guitarist, and I am not a guitarist, I can pr put the autoplay pattern on and then press a chord strip, and it comes out with a beautiful finger picking pattern, which I'm not doing manually, but I do need to change chords at the right time to make it play the right chord in the song for me. So there's a musical element of timing there where you're changing chords, but it's going to generate the pattern that's being played. So with Paco Bell's Canon, I added a smart guitar part as an accompaniment and simply played the chords that go along with the, the bass notes. Now, if you've ever used the smart guitar or any of the smart instruments before, when you open it up, it has a default set of chords on the screen. And I did want to show this picture tonight to just let you know if you're not, um, if you if you weren't aware, you can actually change the chords that appear on the screen and change the order of them. So if you're familiar with Paco Bell's Canon and you look at the screen right now, what I've done is set up the chords in the right order from left to right to make it super easy for me to play them um, as a student. So what I can do is hit record and I'm just going to play D, A, B minor, F sharp minor, D, uh, G, D, G, A, and then start again if I was to start the cycle over again. So manually changing them in that way makes it super easy for students who may not be so confident in picking the chords out in, in the order that's uh, a little bit different to the way they're going to be played. So useful tip tonight, 
To do that, um, there's a wrench icon at the top right and in that menu is the place where you can choose to edit chords. So if you want to try that out uh, sometime, you can see it there. Now, the drum part that I added in this one, I used the beat sequencer in GarageBand and that's what this looks like. Oh, that, that, this is what that looks like. And you can add sounds to create a drum pattern. Again, don't have time, unfortunately, to go step by step through how to do that. But this is a great one to experiment with and add sounds and create a drum pattern nice and quickly, but still uh, using musical skill. So this is what it looks like when you've when I've created my um, my my end result. So the top track that you can see there is the cello part playing the the bass line. The second one down on the screen here is actually the composed melody. I created an original melody to go with this. The third one down is that smart guitar part with some nice chord picking pack patterns. Then. I did add a couple of the traditional string parts in there and I actually used the ahu, the string, uh, the, the Chinese world instrument that we talked about before. And then there's a drum pattern as well. So in my example video here, you're going to hear me uh, demonstrate or see me demonstrate how to play the cello bass line. And then you're going to see me I think demonstrate from memory the smart guitar part and then uh, just play the thing through a little bit of the, the final product. So just a snippet of the final version there, but that's basically it. So um, yeah, it's hard. Nada, yeah, Nada's saying yeah, it is hard to hear the examples. Uh, yeah, I will be uploading a nicer version for you to access. Uh, I explained earlier on that the uh, technical issues I had today meant that I couldn't play them in the nicest way possible. Uh, and just reading Kath's question, uh, does it have? No, it doesn't have any didgeridoo, unfortunately. Yeah, and. Yeah, I know. And it I'm hoping that they will expand their collection of world instruments. That would be really fabulous. Didgeridoo would be a great one, wouldn't it? Because um, not only is it, yeah, it's, it's, you know, relatively unusual to have one in the classroom, uh, it's difficult to play as well, even if you do have one. So it would be great to have something that you could use on here. All right, I'm going to quickly talk through this last one and I've gone a little bit longer than I expected tonight, but that's okay. If you need to leave, that's totally fine. This uh, will be recorded. But do stick around if you would like. Um, I'll go through this last one, which is superhero soundtracks, superhero movie soundtracks, and uh, then then we'll open up to a question and answer time at the end as well. And thank you for sticking around. Yes, um, I know, I, I'm not sure why I dropped out, but I did just briefly and we're all good, I think, now. So thank you for sticking around. So this last one is about composing a theme of some sort which you can then synchronise to a movie clip. Now, this is a really popular thing to do and I always get lots of questions about how to do this in the GarageBand app. Now, doing it in GarageBand on the iPad is quite different to doing it in GarageBand on the desktop version. And that is because you can't import a movie directly into the GarageBand app on iPad. It's just not something that's an option. You can do that on the desktop version. So if you have access to the desktop version and you are really wanting to do the type of film scoring where you match sound effects exactly 
picture action that's on the screen, like a dog bark and a door close and then a big, um, you know, crescendo and a chord when there's an explosion on the screen. Matching those things up very precisely is not something you can do on the GarageBand app on iPad. However, you can still do projects which are film scoring projects. You just need to take a different approach. So the thing that I've always suggested is that you create something that music that sets a scene. So the kids can still talk, you know, you can talk with them about creating music that invokes a place or a time or a character like we all do with film scoring. And then their end product is just going to be a timed piece of music which fits the time length of the movie clip that you're working with. So the one that I've picked for this, and there was a few reasons for picking this, is a superhero theme. Now, the reason I picked this was it's it's, um, fairly easy to find examples of superhero themes and uh, it was really hard. I really wanted to find a variety of superheroes which were not all just male superheroes. I wanted to get sort of a, a combination. But one of the good things is that the most recent Captain Marvel movie, the not only is the main character female, but the composer of the theme is also female. The composer of the, the soundtrack is a female composer too. So that made me happy, <laughs> which was a good thing. And uh, there are some listening examples that you can play for students to talk about what are the characteristics of a superhero theme. And there are some really common themes, uh, things, characteristics that happen across multiple superhero themes uh, that that kind of uh, maybe cliches, I suppose. So things like a driving rhythm is a really common thing. Uh, the the melody is frequently played by brass, French horns or a whole brass section. And you can talk about all these common characteristics with students and they can, you know, consider whether to use those in their, their own theme that they compose too. So what they're going to do is compose their own theme. And then I've added a step of recording a voiceover to this simply because the movie clip that I chose was the Superman uh, kind of opening of the Superman cartoons, the classic cartoons in the past, which, you know, the opening which starts off uh, faster than a speeding train, uh, more pow- no, that's not right, <laughs> faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive. Uh, that That little clip is actually in the public domain because the Superman cartoons are quite old now and they're, they're in the public domain. So I've taken that clip and edited it down so it's short and it's just that little intro, and the kids are going to compose something which goes with that. They can then record their own version of the voiceover, and they can either choose to do a replica of the original Superman intro, or they may even want to sort of make up their own version. They may like to make up their own narration to go over the top. Once you've done this and composed your theme in GarageBand, you can actually send it straight across to the iMovie app and add the movie clip to the soundtrack there to get them both to play together. So it's a great thing to do. It's lots of fun. And I'm just going to show you what this looks like for me in the version that I did. So what I did was to create, uh, first of all, was to take those common elements in superhero themes and uh, recorded a driving rhythm using the the drum kit at the top. I recorded a rhythmic but melodic at the same time string part using the smart strings, which is the second track down. The third and fourth tracks, um, well, the third track down is a, a brass melody or theme. The fourth one is some chords to go with that, also played by the brass. And the vintage kit part that you can see, the last uh, green one down the bottom there, is just a cymbal roll towards the end. Now, at the very bottom, my son Josh did actually record the narration for me for this one. And he recorded it all in one go, but we actually ended up splitting it into little tiny portions so that I could move the clips around to make the timing a little bit better. So that's why there's little um, sort of segments of his recorded part there. Now, when we recorded his uh, narration, again, we used one of the effects. We chose the telephone effect uh, because it, it sort of sounded authentic for that type of theme. And after we had created in GarageBand, we did send it across to iMovie. So that's the iMovie app icon there. 
and it ends up looking like this. So the little Superman movie clip, this is this is actually inside iMovie. This is the Superman clip and I've added the soundtrack and then you press play and you can hear, hear and see both things at once. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman! Possessing remarkable physical strength, Superman fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice disguised as a mild-mannered newspaper reporter, Clark Kent. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman! Possessing remarkable physical strength, Superman fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice, disguised as a mild-mannered newspaper reporter, Clark Kent. So that was my little example of a Superman theme that um, I composed and got my son to, to read over the top. It was probably difficult to hear his narration, but hopefully you'll get a better sense when you see the proper recording at some point. Lots of fun. You can see it's a very short film clip. You really don't need uh, a, a long film clip at all. I've done film scoring workshops where I've used anything from 15 seconds in length up to a maximum of one and a half to two minutes or so. And the longer the movie clip, the 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 more less than time you're going to spend on the project. So just bear that in mind if you're choosing uh, you know film clips to use for students. Oh, it's, I've got a comment that he was nice and clear. Oh, that's good. Thank you. I feel like I need to change the balance of tracks a little bit myself. But yes, um, he he does a very good job with all that stuff. So that's it for the five lesson plans today. This was just a taster of some of the ones that I'm getting ready for this new course and lesson plan collection that's going into the, the Midnight Music community. Now, I mentioned earlier, the plan is to have things by ready by the beginning of May. And there's actually a waiting list that you can join. If you, if you want to know just when it's available, there's no commitment uh, to sign up or anything. But if you want to know when it's available and when it's coming out, you can enter your email address and we'll just keep you informed. Along the way, I'm actually going to send out um, a free lesson plan, a printable lesson plan and access to one of the videos, one of the proper teaching videos that's part of this course. So uh, you'll get that if you sign up to the waiting list and you, you want to receive more information about it. Now, inside the community, this is what it's going to end up looking like. This is a, a pre actually a preview. Um, none of the members have seen this yet. We have a section where the course will live and um, I've been talking a lot about the lesson plans that are part of this course tonight but there's actually a whole beginning section which is walking you through different aspects of the app so if you've never used it before or if you haven't used it much or it's been a while I'm going to talk through particularly from a teacher's point of view how to use the app and and the sorts of things that I've come up with uh, up against I should say when using it with groups of people and on school networks and so on, there's some kind of unique quirky things as a teacher that are not experienced by the general everyday GarageBand iPad user. So that's the, the tack that I take when I'm, I'm doing the training course stuff here. So you can see there's multiple modules um, walking you through different parts of, of using the app, but then the main part uh, at the end is the collection of lesson plans. So, so this is what it will look like. There's a teacher video for each one and a lesson video as well. Oh, and that's what one of the lesson plans looks like when you get the, the actual lesson plan. So if you, if you are interested in learning more about it, uh, feel free to sign up to the waiting list, uh, which is this, uh, this address here on the screen. I will also pop this into the chat window uh, just in a moment <laughs> uh, in case you want to join up. So I, I hope that they were useful and it's useful for you to see some of the ways that you can use GarageBand app, you know, in your classes. 
some of you may be using it already. If you are, I'd love you to tell me what you're doing in the classroom already with the app. Um, I know some people use it for straight up recording of, um, you know, students performing ensemble pieces and so on. And that's a fantastic use of the app as well. It doesn't always have to be like, you know, multi-track recording and so on. You can just open up the microphone, the audio recorder track, hit record and students can record themselves. And it can be like for archival purposes or practice purposes and so on. Uh, just checking the the question win, uh, time. Sorry, question time and the questions in the chat window. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and I'll we'll open up to any questions that you'd like to ask. Uh, let me just get out of this for a second. I'll pop that link in uh, a little bit later as well. Stop screen sharing. We'll come back onto the screen now. Hopefully, I think I missed. Here we go. That's it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so I'm just reading yours, Kath. Um, I've got comments down here on my iPad, so I'll take a look at those. Kath's been working on a film music task. Excellent. Oh, yeah, great for year nine kids. And she, she wants to know, take the score to go with the clip. And, yeah, um, yeah. so Kath's just saying she would like to the kids to notate their score to go with the clip, but thinking after seeing this you might use GarageBand for them to play with ideas as a precursor to the task. I think that's an excellent idea. Notation, um, it's, it's really good. I've actually done film scoring stuff in Sibelius before, which has worked really well, but there's an, a little bit of an extra barrier because in order to compose what's in your head, you need to know what the notation is supposed to look like in order to notate it, if that makes sense. It's quite diff It can be difficult. So, so doing it in something like GarageBand where you're just playing things in, uh, the very first time I did that Superman example, it was a, a different one, and I actually had two devices going. I had the, the Superman movie on my um, laptop screen and I had my iPad with GarageBand. And I literally played along with it, kind of like the old school, you know, the silent movie cinema thing and the, the pianist playing along with what's going on the screen. I, I did it that way the first time because I could just think freely through my fingers and through the sound and I didn't need to time it to specific bars and beats and so on. In fact, I turned the metronome off so it was quite free. And that's probably a preference for some kids is just to kind of work freely. Uh, something like this, especially something very short, they don't need to work necessarily to a metronome beat. It can be a little bit more free and therefore they not, don't need to work, um, you know, to, to certain time values which they would need to work out for notation. So I think that's a great idea. And then moving it onto the notation if you need to get there is a great next step after that. Yeah, and um, yeah, comment from, yeah, about using iMovie. I think using iMovie is really good. Yes, and uh, the trailer thing, I haven't played much with the trailer thing. iMovie, for those that don't know, has its own, uh, like a trailer template option that you can use. And if you've never used iMovie before, don't, don't be too scared. It's not that hard. Um, in the video that I've got for sort of running through how to do this lesson specifically for the students, I walk through exactly what all the screens look like and what you need to press. And it's really not hard. From GarageBand, you literally press copy to iMovie as a button. And then iMovie automatically opens up. You don't even need to find it. And then it says, do you want to add it to a new project or to an existing project? And you just choose which one that is um, and put the movie in there. It's, it's pretty straightforward and, and not too hard. Yeah, and yes, um, and Kath's just saying it's good to have the two screens to start with. Yep, I agree. Uh, I actually suggest that in the less in the written lesson plan, I actually say if you've got access to more than one device, or you know, especially if kids are working with in groups, um, if they've got a couple of iPads per group, one can play the movie and the other can create be used for creating the music. Um, it can be a great way to do it and it doesn't have to be the final version but I got a sense of how things would fit together and then I, I put the movie away and just composed in GarageBand and, and that worked quite well. Um, ideally, I mean, the desktop version I love because you can see both at once but, you know, you just work with what you've got <laughs> and the app version just does it this way and it's not so bad. It, it's all good. Excellent. 
So any any questions about anything we've talked about tonight or uh, GarageBand app in general, happy to ask uh, answer questions about that or any other music tech <laughs> general stuff, anything you're struggling with or having issues with at the moment, happy to do that too. Um, I know it's been quite a while that we've been online now, so if you do need to go, I will understand that's fine, but I will hang around for a bit longer if you would like to ask any other questions. And I'm just checking my window down here. I have to say it's been lots of fun putting the projects together for this new course and um, I've got way too many ideas that I will ever be able to actually create but I'm going to try. I'm going to try do most of them I think and yeah, there's, it's just a lot of fun. I think it's a, it's a good app. There's so much to this app. It's not funny. And in fact, when I was looking at the early modules for the course and what I would explain, um, there's some great videos on YouTube already that go into immense detail about how to use each of the instruments, for example. So uh, what I've ended up doing for this course, um, from my point of view, is create my own video which talks through some general basics and uh, things to look out for as a teacher when you're working with students. But then I'm also going to include some curated content, which I found really useful. So things like um, there's a there's a guy, oh, his name escapes him, but he has a great YouTube channel all about GarageBand app. And he has some great videos which already go into massive detail about playing all the little things that you can do within certain instruments and stuff. So um, yes, question about uh, can you search on YouTube to find this live session? Yes, is the answer. <laughs> um, what you would search? No, I have a channel and if you look up the Midnight Music channel, you should see it there as the most recent one when it becomes available on YouTube, which will be uh, not instantly when we finish, I believe, but a little while after. It might be a few hours later. But it should be the most recent one on the Midnight Music channel. So you can look that up. And if you're on my mailing list already, uh, we will send a link around. And especially if you uh, if you join the GarageBand wait list with that link that I put up, um, the, we will also send the link around in an email to everybody that's on that, that list too in case people didn't get to the session. I will just paste that link into the chat window now um, so that while, while you're still typing questions and so on, and that way you can click on it and sign up there if you need to. Of course, I cleared my history. <laughs> oh, not wish list. Wait. List. I'm typing madly here. Sorry. <laughs> Makes for good, um, good TV when you're typing. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah, that's the one. All right. There's the link there. Um, Kath, just going back to your question about are there advantages of the GarageBand in iPad as opposed to laptop version? There, To be honest, there are some advantages of the iPad app version and then there are advantages of the laptop version. And it, it's a shame that they're not identical in a way. There are a number of things on the iPad version which I miss when I'm in the desktop version. Um, mainly kind of like the way the smart instruments work, being able to play those smart instruments, although I suspect they're going to add them into the desktop version at some point. Um, and the sampler particularly is not in the desktop version at all, not the way it is in the, the iPad. And uh, I feel like the world instruments are not there either, although you can access the loops, world instrument style loops, but you can't, I don't think yet you can play the Ahu and the the Peeper and the other drum kits and stuff, the, the world ones. So, yeah, so there are, I mean, in the best of all worlds, you'd have both, I guess. Um, I know most of you don't have that luxury, but, but uh, yeah, they, they are both really good and uh, I do like them both, but they are a little bit different. Brielle, good night. Thank you. And uh, thanks for staying around. <laughs> yeah, it's getting late. And hello from Bermuda, a follower from Bermuda. Thank you. I don't know your name, but hello and welcome. And thank you, Kylie. I'm glad it's been useful. And thank you, Liz in the UK. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say. Yeah, <laughs> a bit overwhelming, yeah. I, I was, um, yeah, tossing up with not 
showing too much and then wanting to show a lot of stuff. So, yes, it's always a thing. But, yeah, um, the thing that I think is good to do is to take ideas and concepts at this point and then, you know, if you want more help uh, later down the track, well, maybe take one idea and um, explore that as an option. And down the track, if you want to explore some of the other ones or, or see the, the sort of the step-by-step -step instructions that, that I'm getting together once they're ready, um, that makes it a little less overwhelming, I think. And, yeah, Kylie's just saying use the app for recording ensembles. Excellent. And singing students. Yeah, yep. I think that's a really great use of it, especially if you're um, an ensemble leader, um, instrumental teacher, studio teacher. It can just be great getting kids to record themselves and giving them audio feedback. You know, it's instantaneous audio feedback, which uh, we all know when you're recorded and you hear yourself playing back on a recording, things happen that you don't realise were happening and suddenly you're not as good as you thought you were or you're less in tune than you thought. Um, so it's a very good way of using it. <laughs> oh yeah, go. I just saw the, the comment about not typing in public. <laughs> um yeah, and look, the comment about buying the iPad projects without joining the community. So to be yeah, so here's the thing, right? And and look, I wouldn't mind your feedback on this, whoever's still left on the call. We are we haven't decided yet, but we're actually considering selling this as a standalone option but it will also go into the community too. So if you're a member of the community or thinking of joining up, you'll still get access to it. And in fact, you'll get access to it earlier because I'm going to release bits as they're ready. So for the members, that's what will happen. But we are also um, considering as a testing thing, selling this as a standalone option. So um, the idea that we've got in our heads at the moment, and I say we, I, I work with a couple of other people. I have a... Um, my friend Kat, who works as like a project manager with me, she and I are thinking about having the option of, you know, when you go to purchase, there'll be two options. One will be standalone, just this thing on its own, one off price, or join the community and you'll get access to everything. It'll be a little bit different price joining the community, but you'll get access to this much more. And that will suit some people. And I know that some of you, um, there is a barrier. And this is why we're considering it. I know that for some of you, it's a barrier signing up to an ongoing subscription, which is what the community is. So tell me, yeah, tell me, um, some of you are typing in already. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> oh, the same person. <laughs> Sorry, guest 179. I don't, I'm not sure, sure what your name is. You probably said earlier. Um, but yeah. So yes, definitely something we're considering. Um, uh, I, I, I'm I fairly certain that we will do it. I'm not going to make promises because we need to just iron out some technical things around how we get the course to people who are not part of the community. Uh, I think that we can do that. We can unlock just one part of the community for this course and the rest would be shut off. But if you are a member of the overall community, you'd get access to everything. So I'm pretty sure that's how it will work. Um yeah, Liz. Sorry, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't remember. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yep. Kath's just saying it might be a good option um, to build technology and, and for affordability. Yeah, I think so too. Um, it's something that I've been toying with. It, it makes a lot more sense for me as a business to have the ongoing community uh, as the main thing that I do uh, for many different reasons. And essentially for when people join it, it also, it does actually make financial sense in the long run because of all of the things that you get access to. But I do understand that it's not an option for some people. So, yeah, so we might test it with this. It may not be uh, something that we do for everything all the time, but, uh, you know, we, we've just been toying with the idea of testing it as an option for this one and see how it goes. And then, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, toss it up for the future for anything else that's um, created for, for other things. Excellent. Still quite a few people online I can see. Um, I'm sure these, some people have just not closed their browser down. <laughs> the chat window shows anyone who's still got the browser window open and they, they may have actually gone to bed or gone off to lunch. If you're in the UK, it's probably lunchtime now. And uh, oh, just going back, a couple of other questions I've missed, sorry. Um, 
payday certificate for this session. There will be a payday certificate for members. That's one of the benefits of the members. So this is normally a members only training session. And so if you're a member and um, you can log into the community, there'll be a payday certificate available for this time. Yes. Um, so it's not something that if you're a non-member, you can get access to for this particular one. And, <laughs> oh, Kath's just saying, uh, could the school pay for online community membership? Yeah, and that, that is another option. I know some teachers, um, it, it, it doesn't always come out of the music department budget, uh, something like this, because it's professional development. I know it's not true of everywhere, but uh, some schools have a specific separate uh, professional development budget for their teachers. And so, sometimes people have an option of it coming out of that bucket rather than taking away from money that you need to spend on instrument repairs and all the other things. So, so yeah, maybe explore that as an option at your school. And, yeah. Okay, yep. Oh, fair enough. Yep. You're just saying that you'd only have iPads, so not, not so relevant to join the whole community. That is totally fair enough. Yes, yes. And that is a good point too. Um, yeah, so the question, the last question that just came through about seeing a lesson plan example, yes. So if you join that, uh, if you scroll back up and just join that um, waitlist link that I put just a little bit further up, I'm going to be sending a sample lesson plan, uh, probably one of the ones you've seen tonight, to that list. And um, I will also send to that list, it won't just be the lesson plan, it'll be the downloadable lesson plan, but also the full video of me walking it through. So the version that I showed you tonight is really just a taster version, overview of the lesson. Uh, so the thing that I've made for this actual course is a proper walkthrough and there's two videos for each lesson. One is just for teachers. So the first thing I do is talk to you as teachers about what the point of the lesson is and what the students are going to do and what they're going to get out of it and, you know, the, the outcomes and so on and any... Uh, any little tips as well that uh, things that I've seen, you know, that you look out for when you're running the lesson in GarageBand on iPad? Can't think of a specific example right now, but you, you know the sorts of things. The things that you know go wrong and you go, next time I do this, I need to change that. So my teacher video talks about that aspect. And then separately, there is a student video which may be for the teacher as well, but uh, it's a, a basically a walkthrough exactly step by step of open up GarageBand, start a new document, add this track, scroll through here, find this instrument. It's um, me showing you everything step by step on the GarageBand screen and you can hear me playing the instruments and recording and, and everything else. So, so that's what the student video is. So if you join that wait list um, in the coming week or two. <laughs> Actually, it'll probably be earlier next week. I don't want to promise, but probably around early next week, um, there will be a lesson plan example sent with the videos and everything that goes along with it. Great. And just going... Yeah, yep. Yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. Liz is just saying small school and music doesn't have a large budget. I know. It's a struggle. I know. Some, oh, I hear some horror stories in some of the Facebook groups about um, some music teachers having a whole year's budget of only $50 or something ridiculous like that. Yeah, and yes, that's what I was thinking, Kathy, um, PD or ICT budget. Um, yeah, <laughs> every now and again I ask, get asked about the NISA accredited courses. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Um, oh, to, I haven't done that yet and for me, unfortunately, it's a tossing up of um, spending a lot of time filling out lots of paperwork in order to get accredited uh, versus how many people inside my community and in my general audience all together are in New South Wales. <laughs> and, so, and unfortunately, it's only a small number at the moment. At some point, I would like, it's been on my list to, to get done. Apparently, I've heard the, the um, process is not as painful as it used to be. 
So, yeah, I do need to look at it and see if it's not not too bad. Um, in the past, it has been so ridiculously painful that it, it really was not worth the time, unfortunately, and and therefore I was just saying to people use it as teacher-identified PD. But, yeah, I know you can't use that for everything. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't promise that that will be in the very near future, but sometime, sometime. All right. If there are no more questions, I'm going to wind up. We've been going for quite some time now. So thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's been great to, to chat to, to you and to see people online. And uh, have a good rest of the evening if it's evening for you or morning. Um, have some more coffee if you're in the States and you got up nice and early for this and thank you for doing that. And uh, have a great lunch if you're in the UK because it's probably about that time now there. <laughs> So I will uh, stop this broadcast and then this recording will be available on YouTube and the Midnight Music channel, you can head there and uh, see it as the, the most recent video. It should appear there um, in the next few hours. So thank you, everybody. See you soon. Oh, one more thing. Uh, the next month, there is another one of these. There's one of these each month and I've meant to say that earlier. Uh, I'm just going to check the date. Uh, I believe it's the 15th of May is the next one. It's the 15th of May for me here in Australia at, um, and therefore I think it's the 14th of May if you're in the States because the time will be different. So the next one will not be evening time for the Australians. It will be evening for the US teachers. So it's a Tuesday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 14th of May. I think I've got that correct. And therefore, it's the 15th of May for us here in this in Australia. And it's around 10 in the morning or so. So for some of the Aussies, I know you'll be teaching, but I like to shift it around each month just to vary things for the different time zones. <laughs> Thank you, Kath. Have a, have a good night too. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I will sign off now. So thanks, everybody, and I hope to see you at the next one. Bye-bye.